Hi, this is Tony Elwick. I want to thank you for joining us today. Putting jobs to be done theory into practice certainly comes with a share of challenges. Today we want to address some of those challenges so that you can fully experience the benefits of the theory and outcome-driven innovation. I want to start with some basic tenets of jobs theory. Uh, first and foremost, you know, people buy products to get a job done. And products that win in the marketplace are those that get the job done better and or more cheaply. We also know that a job to be done is stable over time, making it a very attractive unit for analysis, and that a job to be done is always a process. We've also learned that a job to be done is functional and has emotional and social jobs associated with it. And lastly, we know that understanding the job to be done provides a new avenue for understanding customer needs, which are unmet, and that there are segments of customers with different unmet needs. So all this falls in line with the basic jobs theory which is there are situations that arise in people's lives where they turn to products to help them get a job done better and or more cheaply. And if we can only understand in detail what that job is, companies will be better informed to create solutions that will get the job done better. We've been applying this theory for years, and our basic premise behind this is let's understand the underlying process that people are trying to execute. We think the benefit of the approach is that you can apply Six Sigma thinking to um, innovation by breaking down that job into its component parts and applying metrics, understanding the metrics that customers use to measure success when getting the job done. And we, when we know those metrics that they're using, we can figure out which are underserved. We can figure out uh, other segments of customers that are underserved along different dimensions. And we can use those insights to guide the innovation process. Our first attempt at this was back in 1992 when we worked with Cordis Corporation. It was one of our first uh, applications of the outcome-driven innovation process. And we focused on interventional cardiologists who were trying to get a job done, which was to restore blood flow in a blocked artery. And again, by breaking down that process into its component parts and understanding the metrics they use to measure success, we were able to generate solutions that help them get the job done better. And the whole goal here is to make innovation more predictable. In this case, we could understand those metrics at a very granular level and understand exactly which were most important and underserved and what solutions Cordis had um, available to it to help get the job done better. And this is what l led to winning products. Uh, we've uh, documented our approach in pretty good detail over the years. And uh, we introduced the process to Clay Christensen back in 1999, who talked about it in his book, The Innovative Solution, uh, calling it Jobs to be Done Theory. Uh, Clay still promotes the theory today in his latest book in, from 2016, um, where he describes um, the approach and all the applications uh, from marketing strategy innovation perspective. Which comes to one of the key things we want to address. Uh, there's there's many different ways to put the theory into practice. And as you read about it, it can become a little bit confusing. And what we've learned is that jobs to done theory is applicable across many different fronts. It can be used for lots of different jobs, if you will. And that's what's happening. There's different people within organizations using jobs theory to get different jobs done. And that's what we want to talk about today. We want to focus on four job executors in particular, one being entrepreneurs, managers, and corporations who are using the theory to figure out what jobs their company should go after. And we're talking about this as market selection and what groups of people and what jobs are people trying to get done um, and which ones should we go uh, focus on to create the most value. The second application was with product market planners, um, strategists, and so on innovation managers who are trying to use the theory to figure out what products do we create, how do we position those products in the marketplace, what value propositions do we use. A third group are the product developers. This is uh, UI, UX designers who are using the theory to help inform the development of product features and products uh, that have been uh, approved for development. And last, uh, the purchase process. We see marketing and customer experience managers using the theory to understand the buyer's journey and enhancing the experience. So we want to talk about all four of these applications, uh, talk about the tools that are needed for each and some of our experience uh, in each of these areas. 
So we'll start with market evaluation and selection. Now, as people try to figure out what markets to get into, it's really a, a two-step process. Uh, the first is to figure out, well, what are all these different jobs that people are struggling with? So it's more of a discovery phase, uh, discovering those unique jobs that people are struggling with and trying to get done. And then once we have that list of, of unique jobs, then we need some way to evaluate them to see which ones we should go pursue. And then in the end, we'll have a prioritized list of markets that we'd want to go enter. And of course, this has a great benefit for uh, corporate managers who are trying to lay out a portfolio of markets they'd like to invest in in the future. And it's very beneficial for an entrepreneur or a startup who's trying to figure out, well, you know, what, where do I want to invest my money and create value for customers and have a successful product? So when we start thinking about this, we, we, define, it, um, we define markets as a group of people, the job executor, and the job they're trying to get done. And what we're trying to figure out as we discover these different jobs are, you know, what are these different groups of people and different jobs they're trying to get done? It could be music enthusiasts who are trying to listen to music, for example. It could be parents who are trying to pass on life lessons to children. It could be tradesmen who are trying to cut wood in a straight line. But it all follows a similar pattern where there's a group of people and the job they're trying to get done. Now, the way we like to define the job is always in a similar fashion because the next step in, in this is we're going to evaluate these different options to see which job is most attractive to go pursue. So we break this down into a two-step process where we define the set of job, jobs and uh, we have very clear uh, nomenclature around which we define these jobs. They define as functional jobs, uh, like you see here, cut a piece of wood in a straight line. Uh, begins with verb, there's an object of control, there's a contextual clarifier. And what we've learned over the years is that there uh, are characteristics of a job statement that we need to have in place in order to use that statement effectively in the market selection process. So the perfect job will describe the process that the customer is trying to execute. We mentioned here again that it's functional, not emotional. It's defining exactly what the customer's trying to accomplish, solution agnostic. It's abstracted at a level that requires, uh, that will reveal opportunities for growth, but abstracted at a level that fits within the organization's capabilities. So with this in mind, coming up with a, uh, a list of, of jobs that you may want to pursue, you can begin to fill a, a portfolio, potential portfolio of, of possible markets you'd like to enter. The next phase then is evaluating those markets for attractiveness. And for this, we've created a tool that we've been using for years that um, evaluates markets um, in, in a unique perspective. So for example, if you're trying to figure out which market's most attractive from a revenue perspective and how big the market is, um, in, in many cases, you know, markets, especially new markets, there are no sales records of products that have been sold in the market because from that perspective, has you know, products haven't been invented yet. So, how do you size markets in a more attractive fashion and figure out which ones are most uh, you know attractive to pursue? Well, a couple of rules of thumb. You know, we look for, for example, number of job executors. Would you rather pursue a market that has 3,000 job executors or 30 million job executors? Would you rather pursue a market that is executed once a year uh, uh, or you know, many times per day, or would you rather, rather uh, pursue a market in which is a growing number of job executors or a declining number of job executors? Well, what we've done is we've created this tool that um, allows us to evaluate these uh, different opportunities along all these different dimensions. I believe there's 42 different metrics in total. And by understanding how each market uh, addresses each of those metrics and which one's most attractive, uh, we can figure out which markets we'd want to go pursue. Uh, you can find this tool available for download on the Stratagen homepage at Stratagen.com. Now, sometimes when we're thinking about you know, what is the job the customer is trying to get done, sometimes the job is not that obvious. Uh, for example, you know, people use smart home products for many purposes. If you're in the smart home market, how do you break down the jobs that customers are trying to get done? Or if you're in banking, 
How do you understand the jobs that customers are trying to get done? Or in social media, and we've worked in many of these places over the years and identified a, a pretty interesting way to come up with these jobs and pinpoint them. We rely on both qualitative and quantitative research to accomplish this goal. So for example, if we were focused on smart home products and trying to help a company figure out, well, what are the jobs that people are trying to get done in a smart home? We would go talk to customers and ask them about all the different tasks and goals and activities they're trying to accomplish in their smart home. And as you might imagine, there could very well be a hundred or more different goals and tasks and activities they're trying to get done. Well, once we've captured that list of, of, uh, of goals and tasks and activities, we put them in a survey and we ask well, maybe five or 600 people to tell us how important uh, each of those jobs are in their current level of satisfaction. And what we do with that is we uh, then uh, run factor analysis. And what factor analysis does is it groups together like tasks and we can begin to see a, a pattern emerge, if you will. This is a typical uh, output of this type of analysis where we see all these jobs that are similar in nature as called out by the factors. And in the upper right, for example, you may see that there's you know, 10 or 15 activities that people are trying to execute that all relate to automating routine household chores. So that could become you know, one of the core jobs that customers are trying to get done. Or in the bottom uh, left, for example, uh, there might be a number of jobs that relate to protecting the family from illness and so on. And so understanding what these look like at, at the right level of abstraction allows us to take a fairly complex market and break it down into the handful of jobs that, that customers are actually trying to get done as they're buying, in this case, you know, smart home products. So that's the first application. There's one other interesting question that we like asking here, and that is, how much are you paying today to get that job done? And how much are you willing to pay to get that job done perfectly? Now, why do we ask that? Well, it, this gives us a very different way to size a market. You know, people may be spending you know, $50 per year right now trying to get a job done, but they might pay 500 to get it done perfectly. And if we understand what that, uh, what they are willing to pay to get it done perfectly, uh, this gives us some idea of the, the market potential that might exist. You know, a market that looks fairly small um, based on current product sales in that space may actually be you know, multiples of, of the size of that market. So the next question often comes, well, what do you mean by perfectly? How do we know how to get the job done perfectly? And this is where um, our outcome-driven innovation approach uh, really shines. And this question is typically answered in the market and product strategy process. When we think about the market and product strategy process, the goals are typically to figure out, you know, how do I align my current products alongside the opportunities that exist in the market? Or what value proposition should we pursue? Or how do I make sure my marketing communications resonate with customers? Or how do I improve my existing products? Or can I come up with altogether new products that will address uh, adjacent and new market opportunities? All this is part of the strategy and innovation process that we, we refer to as the, the market and product strategy. We've developed a lot of tools for this purpose over the years. Uh, this is what Outcome Driven Innovation is really defined to help accomplish. And it's broken down into these six steps, uh, defining what that job to be done is, which of course is what we did in that last uh, step when we we're doing market selection. We figured out what's that group of people and what job are they trying to get done? Now, once we know what that job is, then we can begin to uncover the customer's needs. We can break down that process into its component parts, figure out how people measure success and value in getting the job done, and step three, quantify that to figure out which of those needs are unmet. In the fourth step, we can discover what we call hidden segments of opportunity. And what we mean by hidden is that if you use typical demographic, psychographic, behavioral, or attitudinal classification schemes, you won't see these segments. Uh, the best way to discover segments of customers with different unmet needs, from our perspective, is to segment around unmet needs. The fifth step in the process is then, once we know what those opportunities are, to align any existing products we have alongside those opportunities, refine a value proposition, marketing communications, and step six, 
put together a product strategy that will help improve our existing products or create altogether new products. And we have tools that we've created uh, over the years to address each of these steps in the process. Uh, to define the job to be done, we typically lay out a, uh, a job map. And this breaks down in detail exactly what the customer is trying to get done at the functional level. We have a good article written on this, uh, published in HBR, called The Customer-Centered Innovation Map from 2008, that goes into a good amount of detail on this tool. The second tool that we've created uh, for uncovering customer needs is the Jobs to be Done need Needs Framework. This lays out all the different types of needs that exist, what those needs look like, and methods for collecting them. The third step in the process, where we quantify the degree to which each, each outcome is underserved, uh, we've created uh, survey instruments that allow us to put surveys in the field to figure out you know, which of these needs are really important and poorly satisfied, you know, which are unmet in the marketplace. We've also uh, discovered uh, outcome-based segmentation methods that allow us to uh, factor and cluster and figure out you know, are there segments of customers with different unmet needs? And we plot these out on our opportunity landscape. The uh, fifth tool that we've created is the job to be done growth strategy matrix. So once we know what opportunities exist, if there's underserved segments, overserved segments, we can begin to think through the types of strategies we want to pursue, whether they're disruptive or differentiated or sustaining or so on. And the last step, we've created tools uh, ideation worksheets, once we know where the opportunities are that exist in the market, to help teams focus on those uh, unmet needs and create solutions that will get the job done better. Let's talk first about the Jobs We've Done Needs Framework. This is really where I think uh, our application shines. Uh, in most companies, there isn't agreement on what a need is or what types of needs exist. Uh, using the Jobs We've Done Needs Framework, we know that there's core functional job that the customer's trying to get done. This is how we define the market. And we can break that job down into its component parts and then figure out what are all the metrics people use to measure success and value when getting the job done. Uh, we define outcome statements, as you see on the bottom here, very specifically with the direction of improvement, metrics that can be measured and controlled in the design of the product, the object of control, and the contextual clarifier. We also know that as people are trying to get the core job done, that they might be trying to get other jobs done at the same time. And if we can discover what those other jobs are, we can create a platform level solution that gets multiple jobs done, making our product more valuable. We also know that the customer has emotional jobs. So as they're trying to get that core job done, they want to be perceived a certain way by their peers or avoid being perceived in a negative way. They want to feel a certain way as a result of getting the job done. These insights help us understand uh, and, and inform the value proposition and marketing communications. We also know that people have to buy and receive and transport and maintain and upgrade their products. These are all consumption chain jobs. And by understanding the product life cycle, uh, we can better understand uh, the user experience and improve that experience so customers are satisfied throughout the product life cycle. And lastly, uh, buyers have financial metrics that they use to measure success and value. So knowing what these metrics are helps us create value from a financial perspective as well. So these are the basics for the needs framework. Once we know what those needs are, we can then figure out which are unmet. And again, we define unmet as a need that's very important and not well satisfied. Once we know what all those unmet needs are, we can then figure out are there segments of customers with different unmet needs? In a typical scenario, we would um, maybe have 100 to 150 different metrics that people use to measure success and value. Uh, there might be agreement along 100 of those metrics, but for the most part, not everybody is going to agree on what needs are important and unsatisfied. So what we look for are needs, for example, where half the population thinks the need is very important and unsatisfied, and the other half thinks it's very unimportant and very satisfied. So in a typical scenario, there might be 20 or 30 different metrics that people disagree on. And those metrics become the foundation for statistical clustering, where we place people in these segments based on how they rate these needs for importance and satisfaction. 
So if somebody thinks that needs 5 and 10 and 15 are really important and unsatisfied, they get placed in one segment. And if someone else thinks needs 40, 45, and 50 are really important and unsatisfied, they get placed in another segment. And then we can begin to understand who these people are, why they're underserved among certain dimensions, and begin to tailor our strategies for very specific solutions at each segment. And this is really the benefit of the approach, where we can pinpoint with uh, a great degree of accuracy exactly uh, where customers are underserved. And the basic premise behind uh, the entire ODI process is to help companies figure out what are the customers' needs, which of those needs are unmet, and are there segments of customers with different unmet needs. And once we've defined that at that level of granularity, we've got a problem definition that becomes uh, much easier to solve. I still like using this example um, of the Bosch circular saw. And the reason I like using this is because uh, circular saws have been around for a long time. And when we looked at this market, on average, there were no unmet needs. But when we segmented around the unmet needs, we found the segment that was about 25% of the market that had 14 unmet needs. And Bosch tailored the CS20 circular saw to address each one of those unmet needs. And the reason I like this is it points out the level of precision that companies need to find opportunities in the marketplace in order to win and the level of granularity that the ODI process provides so that you can discover those opportunities and address the needs accordingly. That's one of many successes that we've had uh, over the years. Uh, in 2010, we engaged in independent research to study our success rate and determined that while the average success rate is somewhere around 17%, uh, the success rate for ODI is about 86%. And there's a great um, track record study that you can uh, download from our website to read all the details behind this as well. Well, that brings us to the third application. Third application requires yet a different set of tools. And I find this to be one of the more interesting applications for product development. Now, in the product development space, we find that jobs theory is being embraced by UX and UI designers. And um, there's an interesting phenomenon that occurs here. And that is, um, and this is based on a study that you can see here from Scrum Analysis uh, Alliance, I'm sorry, uh, from uh, 2015. 52% uh, regarded the key challenge of Scrum as a lack of clearly defined metrics to identify and measure the success of Scrum projects and delivery. Now, the way I interpret this, it takes me back years actually uh, to my IBM days when we think about how back in that time frame, you know, marketing would, you know, throw a, a, a product definition over the wall, we would say, to development, and we'd be left to our own devices to figure out how to go create that product. And this gave rise to the voice of the customer because engineers at that time were struggling to get a good set of product requirements from the marketing team. So they set out on their own to go get the needs and the information they felt was necessary in order to create a great product. Well, I see this happening again, uh, this time in the software space where um, product managers may be struggling to pull together a product strategy like we demonstrated in the previous section, you know, using ODI, I identify a very specific set of needs. And if there isn't a clear uh, set of product requirements going into the de uh, development process, then the UX and UI designers feel compelled to go out and get the information they need to help get the job done uh, better. And they've been embarking on this process, uh, trying to seek out that, that necessary information. And the way we like thinking about this is that uh, in order for a designer to be successful, they need all this information. They need to know the needs around the core functional job and the outcomes associated with that. They need to know the outcomes associated with the consumption chain jobs on installing the product and setting it up and learning how to use it and so on. So these are all key issues that have to come into play. Now, assuming that the product manager has uh, adopted an ODI type approach and provided the development team and designers with a complete set of, of outcomes and metrics that people can use to measure value, um, 
you wouldn't have to go any further. Uh, you could provide them with that insight, and that would inform them. But in many cases, that hasn't happened, at least not yet. And so in those cases, we've been suggesting that our clients use a tool that looks like this. And we call this a strategy's job outcome story template. And what it attempts to do is to shortcut the process, if you will, and put some control in the hands of the UX and UI designer and developers so that they can figure out you know, what is the core job or the job the customer's trying to get done, uh, what outcomes are associated with that core job that they should be concerned with as they develop that feature, and defining the emotional jobs around that as well. And of course, this is not a substitute for a, you know, a full uh, a full blown uh, view of all the requirements on the core job. But what we're su suggesting here is if you don't have that insight, then as a UX UI designer, you can take a tool like this and begin to uh, put it into practice. So I have a few examples here. So you can see, you know, when trying to achieve the job in a certain situation, which is a contextual clarifier, people struggle to address certain metrics and they want to feel and um, be perceived or avoid being perceived in a certain way. So one example is, you know, when I'm trying to engage in conference calls to collaborate with others, I want to minimize the time it takes to find the call and information and avoid being perceived as chronically late for meetings. Now, the reason we like this kind of structure is because even from a feature perspective, it can point out maybe at a more granular level, not so abstracted, uh, exactly what that core job is, uh, one or more different outcomes that are underserved as, as a result of the situation, and uh, what impact it's having from an emotional perspective as well. And we feel that this is the type of information that's needed in order to inform the designer of an effective uh, approach to design. A couple of other examples. When trying to cut wood in a straight line, people want to minimize the likelihood of cutting the cord and want to avoid being perceived as unprofessional. Again, the key elements of what we consider be um, the, you know, the major inputs to define the types of needs that enter the process, the core job, outcomes, emotional jobs. Of course, if you wanted to add related jobs to this and financial as well, you could, but in most cases uh, we see that that's uh, not necessary at, at this level. Another example here, you know, when trying to use software for the first time, people want to minimize the time it takes to learn how to get started and want to avoid being perceived as a slow learner, for example. And uh, obviously there's lots of examples we could give here, but I think the key here is understanding what types of inputs are needed and what types of inputs you don't have already, um, this tool will help offset some of those um, uh, issues that you're having and provide you with some of the information that's needed. Now, this, the last step here as well, the last application, which is the purchase process. Now, a lot of people like studying uh, the time of purchase. You know, what are people thinking? Uh, you know, what are they trying to accomplish? And we find this very interesting as well because we think about the purchase process as uh, a very specific job uh, that the buyer's going through when they're purchasing the product. And we think more about this as the buyer's journey, if you will. When we put this in perspective, um, the purchase process is really just one step in the consumption chain uh, as a consumption chain job. There's many other consumption chain jobs. And the purchase job should not be confused with the core functional job that the person's trying to get done, which is the reason they're using the product, nor should it get confused with related jobs, emotional jobs, financial outcomes, or so on. So when we study the purchase job, we can actually apply this um, ODI thinking to this situation and think about the job. And we can break it down into its component parts and, and job map, if you will, and figure out all the steps that people are going through as they go through the purchase process. And this comes from work that we have done in the space uh, with, with Hart Hanks, who um, asked us to understand, to help them understand, you know, what is the purchase process? What is the buyer's journey? And can we define this in such a way that it applies to you know, many situations? Retailers was the specific target here. 
And this was interesting because you can see that when we think about the purchase process, it's more about figuring out how to define the problem that they're having, determining if they should buy a product, then assuming they want to buy a product to help get the job done, figuring out what solutions to consider and how to evaluate them and where to, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and what product to select, and then figuring out where to acquire that solution, going ahead to, to buy it and receive the solution and so on, return it if necessary, and then finally share that experience with others. And by thinking about the process in this fashion, we can discover opportunities for value creation along the entire buyer's journey. Uh, the way we uh, approach this is we not only took that information uh, that we saw just there in the job map, but we looked at all the different outcomes that customers are trying to achieve as they went through that journey, well over 100 of them, and we quantified them for retailers to figure out you know, where their um, needs were served, you know, better served or underserved. We also discovered hidden segments of opportunity, and we know that retailers uh, do uh, have some opportunities that they could address. And those opportunities are not being addressed by online stores at this point as well. So knowing what those hidden segments of opportunity are uh, it offers some you know, hope and insight into where value could, could be created in the marketplace. And this buy, uh, buyer's journey um, diagnostic tool applies in a lot of situations, and you can read more about it uh, by going to uh, the Marketing Journal uh, website and looking for this article here, Can Bricks and Mortar Compete with Online Retailing? And it reveals a lot more of the details that we discovered as, as part of the uh, engagement. Well, I think that covers it. Uh, what I wanted to cover was these four different, diff uh, different types of applications and show how they're distinctly different and show how the tools you need to execute each of these four uh, different applications are distinct and different. And hopefully that brings some clarity uh, to what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, feel free to reach out to the Strategen website. You can follow me on Twitter at Ulwick. You can contact Strategen at info at I've also set up a email uh, if you'd like to ask me questions personally, ask Tony at strategen.com. And uh, of course, don't forget to uh, get our latest book, Jobs Be Done, Theory to Practice, that came out last October, that goes into more detail about our approach. Well, that's it for now. Uh, thanks again for joining. I appreciate it.